our meeting. And, um, and Mark, uh, I believe that we were on 338 when we left off last time. Okay, November 10th? Yes, please. Okay, November 10th, 1900. The most perfect love is in the true trust in the beloved. As he continued not to come, I felt immersed in the greatest bitterness. My soul was tortured in a thousand ways. Then I felt as though a shadow near me, and I heard the voice of my adorable Jesus, though I could not see him, saying to me, the most perfect love is in the true trust that one must have in the loved object. And even if it should appear that the object one loves is lost, then more than ever is the time to prove this living trust. This is the easiest means to take possession of that which one ardently loves. Having said this, both shadow and voice disappear. Who can say the pain I feel for not having seen my beloved good? So there's so much delight that she experiences when she sees him, it comforts her so much. And really from her heart, there's love that emanates from her when she's given that extra gift of being able to behold him. But the Lord is making a point that is really important for us uh, related to when there's no sense of his presence, when there's um, no um, warm sense or, uh, uh, um, you know, a, a interlocution or any kind of a, a spiritual experience. In fact, even a very dry experience. And so I bracketed uh, from four lines down, the most perfect love is in the true trust that one must have in the loved object. Well, the loved object, obviously, is the Lord in this example. And so <clears throat> I've, I've given this, ex <clears throat> this example before when, when uh, when you're faithful to the Lord and you're telling him you love him and there's all kinds of warm emotions that are being stirred related to the joy that you're deriving from, from your prayer time, that's a good thing. But <clears throat> he sees that you're re realizing a consolation for your time and your self-giving. But when there's no sensitivity that's being stirred and you are choosing to be faithful and trusting him completely, uh, that is very, uh, is much more beautiful to him because he sees your fidelity no matter what. Okay, go ahead. November 11th, 1900. By going out of the divine will, one loses the knowledge of God and of self. It seems that the blessed Lord wants to exercise me in patience. He has no compassion either for my tears or for my most sorrowful state. Without him, I see myself immersed in the greatest miseries. I believe there is no soul more wicked than mine, even though when I am with Jesus, I see myself bad more than ever. However, since I am with him who possesses all goods, my soul finds the remedy for all evils. But when I do not have him, everything is over for me. There is no more remedy for my great miseries. And what is more, I am oppressed by the thought that my state is no longer his will. And not being in his will, I seem to be outside of the center. And many times I think of how good, of how to go out of it. Okay, so we go back to the bottom of page 38. First of all, she said, uh, he wants to exercise me in patience. So she's acknowledging before she makes these statements about her feelings, she's acknowledging that he is testing her or giving her an opportunity to grow in the virtue of patience. But then she goes on to talk about how she feels in this challenge, which is really what was being addressed in the, in the previous passage related to the lack of sense of his, <clears throat> his presence or any emotional stirring. And so, but she's feeling these, um, uh, uh, that he has no compassion. She knows because of the light he's already given her, he is compassion itself. But she's talking about the feelings, this deprivation, this trial that she's going through, either for my tears or for my most sorrowful state. Then she goes on to say, I believe 
that there is no soul more wicked than mine. She's not talking about the kind of wickedness that we see in the world today. She's talking about how seeing how far she is from the immensity of his goodness, going on to say, I see my, uh, uh, when I, however, since I am, since I am with him who possesses all goods, my soul finds the remedy. Well, she see, if you were to wash a window as clean as you possibly could, and then the sun hits it, you're going to see that there's some streaks there, maybe a little bit of lint here or there that you didn't see before. But when the light hits it just right, then you see the imperfections of the, the cleaning that you have just done. Well, that's exactly what happens when she's in the light of his presence. She sees what we would consider maybe insignificant dust or even less than that because of her sanctity. But the expanse of his goodness and the errors, the areas of imperfections in her are what caused her to make these extreme statements about being imperfect. <clears throat> then she talks about, many times I think of, of how to go out of it. And those are temptations. She's not saying I want to go out of it. She's saying many times I think about it. It occurs to her. She's not saying I embrace it, but uh, we can be sure that um, the enemy would like us to doubt everything that the Lord is offering. A lot of people, when they first start reading about Louisa, or they start hearing about this suffering that is to be embraced, it's like, well, that's not for me. And uh, they, they can be tempted to walk away. She may, uses the word, I am oppressed. Well, the Lord never oppresses. The Lord is not an oppressor. So she's experiencing temptation. There's the it, an evil spirit that's trying to pull her off center. Okay, go ahead. Now, being with these dispositions, I felt him behind my shoulders, saying to me, you are tired, aren't you? And I, yes, Lord, I feel quite tired. And he continued, ah, my daughter, do not go out of my will, because by going out of my will, you come to lose the knowledge of me. And not knowing me, you come to lose the knowledge of yourself. In fact, only in the reflections of the light can one distinguish with clarity whether there is gold or mud. If everything is darkness, objects can easily be confused. Now, the light is my will, which gives you the knowledge of me. And in the reflections of this light, you come to know who you are. And in seeing your weaknesses, your pure nothingness, you cling to my arms and united with my will, you live with me in heaven. But if you want to go out of my will, first you would come to lose true humility, and then you would come to live on the earth and would be forced to feel the earthly weight, to moan and sigh like all the other unfortunate who live outside of my will. Having said this, he withdrew, even letting himself be seen. Who can say the torment of my soul? So to choose to go out of the will of God. Now, she, <clears throat> this is huge for her because of the great gift that's being offered. <clears throat> but it's also huge for us. Anytime we are doing other than what we know would please him the most, and especially if we're doing what we know absolutely would not please him, that's sin. And sin deadens our capacity to know the difference between right and wrong. And so this losing the knowledge of his goodness, losing the knowledge of what he has given us as the truth by which we are to live and to set us free, that is caused by sin. And the example would be, think in your own life of a particular sin that you had to deal with because it became a habitual pattern. And at first, <clears throat> The gravity of it seemed more clear, even if it was venial sin, the gravity of it seemed more clear. But with repetitious committing of that sin, it almost can be reduced to seeming like just a weakness or a fault, not that big a deal. The Lord understands. I can tell you, I've heard this kind of explanation many times. <clears throat> so we have to remember this lesson that if we are choosing to go out of his will, if we are choosing something that we know is not what he would want for us or in our treatment of others, 
we're deadening our own capacity to recognize the gravity of it and what could easily move into much more serious sin. This is a teaching of the church. This is not unique to Luis's writings. However, the Lord is making it real clear. He says, we don't, oh, this nothingness. Uh, we don't like to recognize our weaknesses and our nothingness. It takes humility. The two keys for growth uh, unto the receptivity of the gift of the divine will, humility and obedience. Humility and obedience. So this awareness of our nothingness, recognizing our weaknesses, is the Lord doesn't want us miserable in that posture. He wants us to realize how much we need him. Think about the times that you've tried to do something good or you've tried to set aside something that you know is not that good <clears throat> and you fail or you try to do something that uh, you know is uh, an increase in the spiritual journey and uh, you do it for a little while and then you fail. Well, the Lord allows that so that we recognize how much we need him. Not so that we turn away and give up, but so that we run to him and seek every bit of help that he is ready to give us. And then down at the end, this is really pretty important. He says, uh, <clears throat> uh, first, you would come to lose true humility. Uh-oh, that's, that's, that's thinking we can do things on our own and do them well without him. And we can't really do anything good and holy without him. And then you would come to live on the earth and would be forced to feel the earthly weight, to moan and sigh like all the other unfortunate who live outside of my will. So he's saying, take your pick. You can live in that <clears throat> uh, blindness to your weakness and your nothingness. And uh, you can try to make it on your own in the misery that you see all around you and the world is full of it today. Or you can come into the uh, returning to the knowledge that I give you in the truth so that you recognize your need for me and you stay close to me. That's a, a choice that he gives each and every one of us. Go ahead. November 13th, 1900. She sees the many human miseries, the degradation and stripping of the church and the very degrading of priests. After going through several days of most bitter privation, having received Holy Communion, I saw three children within my interior. Their beauty and equality was such that all three of them seemed to be born of the same labor. My soul was surprised and stupefied in seeing so much beauty enclosed in the circle of my so miserable interior. And my stupefaction increased even more as I saw that these three children seemed to have many ropes of gold in their hands. And with these, they bound themselves completely to me and my heart completely to them. Then afterwards, as if each one was taking his place, they began to discuss among themselves. But I could not understand, and I cannot find the words to repeat their most high language. I can only say that in a twinkling of an eye, I saw the many human miseries, the degradation and stripping of the church, and the very degrading of priests, who, instead of being light for the peoples, are darkness. All embittered by this sight, I said, most holy God, give peace to the church. Let her be given back what they have taken away from her. Do not allow the evil to laugh behind the back of the good. And as I was saying this, they said, these are incomprehensible mysteries of God. Having said this, they disappeared, and I returned inside myself. So we see that kind of thing happening in different parts of the world and certainly in the United States. And we need to make the same kind of appeal before God. Uh, so I'm going to pray that prayer that she prayed and you can just unite yourselves with me. <clears throat> and then that uh, some of you um, from last week asked for that, uh, those three um, focuses of the prayer that uh, I put up on the screen right after the Apostles' Creed. If anybody else wants it, uh, I'd be happy to send it to you as an attachment. Our church, desperate, I desperately need your prayers, and all priests in the church desperately need the prayers for purification and sanctification. Not just protection, not just that they can uh, teach well. We, we need the church to be filled, and certainly those that are in seminaries, those are now being ordained, 
<clears throat> those that are approaching the ends of their life. We need the purification and sanctification of all priests. So we'll use this prayer right now because this is what she prayed when the Lord revealed to her that there were priests causing trouble and leading people into darkness. This is not unique to Louisa, although she was ahead with this message of what uh, was given at Garabandal. In Garabandal, the message was uh, bishops and priests are leading the, my people to perdition. And so here's the prayer of Louisa on that day. Most holy God, Give peace to the church. Let her be given back what they have taken away from her. Do not allow the evil to laugh behind the back of the good. Okay, go ahead. November 14th, 1900. The Queen Mama refreshes Jesus. Jesus takes Louisa to purgatory. <clears throat> this morning, on coming, my adorable Jesus transported me outside of myself and asked me for a refreshment for his pains. Having nothing, I said, my most sweet love, if the queen mama was here, she could refresh you with her milk. But as for myself, I have nothing but miseries. At that moment, the most holy queen came, and immediately I said to her, Jesus feels the necessity of a refreshment. Give him your most sweet milk, for he will be refreshed. So our dearest mama gave him her milk, and my beloved Jesus was all refreshed. Then turning to me, he said, I feel cheered. You too draw close to my lips and drink part of that milk which I received from my mother so that we both may be refreshed. This milk <clears throat> certainly uh, in the natural gave the nourishment to baby Jesus, but <clears throat> it was not just uh, human milk because everything that the Blessed Mother did was divinized. There was never a moment that she was not living the divine will in its fullness. She was full of grace. So there was both a, a, a natural nourishment, but there was the very will of God that flowed from her to nourish um, her little son. Go ahead. So I did. But who can tell the virtue of that milk that came out, boiling hot from Jesus? And he contained so much of it that it seemed an immense fount, such that even if all men should drink of it, it would not decrease a bit. After this, we went round the earth a little, and at some place there seemed to be people sitting a little table saying, there will be a war in Europe, and what is more sorrowful, it will be caused by relatives. Jesus was listening, but he did not say anything on that regard. Therefore, I do not know for sure whether there will be or not, since human judgments are mutable, and what they say today, they deny tomorrow. Then he transported me inside a garden, in which rose an immense building, like a monastery, populated by so many people that it was difficult to count them. At the sight of those people, my adorable Jesus turned his back to them. He clung against me with all of himself, leaning his head on my shoulder, close to my neck, and he said to me, My beloved, do not let me see them, otherwise I would suffer greatly. So first I want to go back to this, uh, this milk that would be sufficient to satisfy every human being. Uh, that makes clear that there is not just a human milk, but it is really the divine will that was refreshing Jesus. and. <clears throat> When you invite the divine will into your praying, into your praying the hours of the passion, into your making sacrifices, it's the divine will that gives him relief. It's the divine will that gives him a nourishment or a refreshment. And so um, we can be following the example of the Blessed Mother and following what Louisa is learning, um, souls that offer to him some relief as opposed to all the pain that uh, humanity is causing him. And that's exactly what's going on in this uh, uh, second part of the paragraph where people are talking about a war that's coming. And then the point is being made. Uh, people will say one thing and, divide, and deny it later. We know for a fact that that's the reality. If somebody says something about what's going to happen in the future, and if it happens, they'd like to take credit as if they really had some kind of special insight of, related to the future. 
They might even deny that they said it or uh, express that you misunderstood them if what they were saying is coming does not come to pass. And th so obviously what's going on with these people is displeasing the Lord and he doesn't even want to look at what's going on amongst them. Go ahead. I too clasped him and drawing near one of those souls, I said, tell me at least, who are you? And she answered, we are all purging souls and our liberation is bound to the satisfaction of those pious legacies which we have left to our successors. And since they are not satisfied, we are forced to stay here away from our God. What pain this is for us because God becomes for us a necessary being whom we cannot do without. We experience a continuous death which martyrs us in the most ruthless way. And if we do not die, it is because our soul is not subject to this. So sorrowful are we, being without an object that forms our whole life. We implore God to make mortals experience a minimum part of our pains by depriving them of what is necessary for the preservation of corporal life, that they may learn at their own expense how painful it is to be without what is absolutely necessary. So this is an excellent lesson regarding purgatory. Part of the reason that the Lord would not want to look at those suffering souls is because of the love that he has for them. But uh, take to, to heart this point that the, the lack of what they should have done on earth, even after they have died, impacts their time in purgatory because of the legacy, which is a very popular term in politics these days, but because of what they left, there, there's a, a deficiency that is continuing. Whereas if these, these people that had been impacted by their lives or their actions were drawing closer to the Lord, uh, these souls in purgatory, their, their, their time would not be as long. And think about the poor souls that are in purgatory today that don't have anybody praying for them because of this, this lie out of hell that everybody when they dies are catapulted into heaven. No such thing as anybody needing any purification or being filled up with love for God that was so lacking at the time, at different times of their life. And they're actually saying it, it, it would be good if the people on earth went through some of the suffering that's necessary so that they would turn towards God uh, um, before they find, wind up where we are is, is part of the focus. So we need to be praying for souls in purgatory regularly. Go ahead. After this, the Lord carried me somewhere else. And I, feeling compassion for those souls, said, How come, O oh my good Jesus, you turned your face away from those blessed souls who so much long for you? While it would have been enough that you just let yourself be seen for those souls to be free of the pains and be edified. And he, oh, my daughter, had I shown myself to them, since they are not completely purged, they could not have stood in my presence. And instead of flinging themselves into my arms, confused, they would have drawn back, and I would have done nothing but increase their martyrdom and mine. This is why I did so. Having said this, he disappeared. Increase their martyrdom and mine. Mine, the Lord saying this, is because he loves them so much and he doesn't like to see any soul on earth or in purgatory suffering. Uh, uh, I've used this example before. It, if you were out in the garden and you were filthy dirty, let's say that you were having a good time digging up dirt and pulling weeds and a little bit muddy out there. So now you're just a total sweaty mess with mud all over yourself. You walk in the back door of the house and everybody is dressed in formal clothing and they start singing happy birthday. Now, you might be grateful that they're there to, to be there uh, in your honor, but you aren't going to go sit down at, a, at the table and visit with them the mess that you're in because you become very much aware that you need to clean up before you can be with these people who are so dressed up and so presentable and, and uh, <clears throat> waiting for you. So this is 
just a crummy example in comparison to the way a soul would feel when they know they're not ready to enter into the perfection of God's love, into the perfection of his presence. If Louisa, in the light of his presence, called herself evil or sinful or the worst uh, in the worst condition, <clears throat> how much more would a soul that's in purgatory still needing to be filled with love be aware of how they are not worthy to even be in the visible presence of the Lord? Okay, go ahead. November 16th, 1900. Jesus removes her heart and gives her his love as heart. This morning, after I received communion, my adorable Jesus made me see my interior, all strewn with flowers in the shape of a hut, and he was inside of it, amusing and delighting himself completely. Seeing him in that attitude, I said, my most sweet Jesus, when will it be that you take this heart of mine, conform it completely to yours in such a way that I may live from the life of your heart? While I was saying this, my highest and only good took a lance and opened me at the place corresponding to my heart. Then he pulled it out with his hands and he looked at it thoroughly to see whether it was stripped and possessed those qualities to be able to be inside his most holy heart. I too looked at it, and to my surprise, I saw, impressed on one side of it, the cross, the sponge and the crown of thorns. But as I wanted to see the other side and the inside, for it seemed swollen as if it could be opened, my beloved Jesus prevented me, saying to me, I want to mortify you by not letting you see all that I have poured into this heart. Ah, yes. Here inside the heart, there are all the treasures of my graces that human nature can arrive at containing. At that moment, he enclosed it inside his most holy heart, adding, your heart has taken possession within my heart, and I will give you my love as my heart, which will give you life. And drawing near that heart, he sent three breaths containing light, which took the place of my heart. Then he closed the wound, telling me, Now, more than ever, is it appropriate for you to fix yourself in the center of my will, having my love alone in his heart? You must not go out of it, even for one instant, for my love will find its true nourishment in you only if it finds my will in you, entirely and completely. In it will my love find its contentment and true and faithful correspondence. He says, I will give you my love as heart. Uh, his love is uh, what brought us into existence. His love is everything that we need to continue in existence. Uh, the air that we breathe, uh, the beating of our heart, what uh, nourishes us in food. There's nothing about us that is not sustained by his love, including when we have our back turn towards him when we're making wrong choices his love just keeps on sustaining us and so for him to make this uh, statement that it's his love that's replacing her heart uh, that exchange is because of the perfections of her heart that uh, he's been able to bring about through her cooperation and he doesn't let her see all that he's hidden in her heart because uh, her staying in that posture of humility is so necessary for her to keep moving forward then he goes on to say, you must not go out of it even for one instant, for my love will find its true nourishment in you only if, and this is really important, only if it finds my will in you entirely and completely. So he's asking that of us, that we strive to have his will as the, as the life operating freely, his will is what sustains us for sure, but uh, the giving complete freedom to his will in our heart and our loving is what's necessary for him to move us uh, towards the gift of the divine will. Go ahead. Then, drawing near my mouth, he sent me three more breaths, and he also poured a most sweet liqueur, which inebriated me completely. 
Then, as though taken by enthusiasm, he said, See, your heart is in mine. Therefore, it is no longer yours. And he kissed me over and over again and made many fineness of love to me. But who can say them all? It is impossible for me to manifest them. Who can say what I felt when I found myself inside of myself? I can only say that I felt as if I were no longer myself, with no passion, with no inclination, with no desire completely immersed in God. At the place of my heart, I could feel a sensible icy cold compared to the other parts. So <clears throat> give your heart to the Lord over and over as completely as possible. And he will give his heart more and more to us. He gave himself completely to us. And so when you receive Holy Communion, he's giving himself completely to you and all the more important for you to be striving, for all of us to be striving to give ourselves more and more completely to him. Go ahead. November 18th, 1900. The union of one's heart with that of Jesus makes one pass on to the state of perfect consummation. He continues to keep my heart inside his heart. And every now and then, he deigns to let me see it, making feasts as if he had made a great gain. In these days, when I find myself outside of myself, at the place that corresponds to the heart, instead of the heart, I see the light that blessed Jesus sent me in those three breaths. Then this morning, on coming, showing me his heart, he told me, my beloved, which one would you like, my heart or yours? If you want mine, you will have to suffer more. Know, however, that I have done this to make you pass on to another state, because when one reaches union, one passes to another state, which is that of consummation. And in order to pass to this state of perfect consummation, the soul needs either my heart in order to live or her own completely transformed into mine. Otherwise, she cannot pass on to the state of consummation. And I, all fearful, answered, My sweet love, my will is no longer mine, but yours. Do whatever you want, and I will be more than happy. So she acknowledges, I, um, fearful, all fearful. So think about that. How many times do we... Uh, avoid what, um, what may be costly, uh, whether in sacrifice or experience, where becomes we're aware of the, what it's going to cost. She is being made aware that this consummation that he's offering is going to be more painful. And so the fact that she feels all fearful about it does not prevent her from saying, do what you will with me. I belong completely to you. Uh, a lot of times I've uh, encouraged people in, in their holy hour, if they want to really uh, make progress with the Lord, to be telling the Lord, uh, do whatever you want with me, no matter what it costs me personally. And uh, usually when um, I make that suggestion, maybe the following month when they come, uh, especially at the beginning of uh, recommending this prayer, They'll come back and say, you know, that's kind of a scary prayer to say. <clears throat> but the more that you surrender and trust the Lord, no matter what it costs related to what you think is valuable in life, the more he will give to you. So if we surrender entirely to him, then it frees him to give us more and more of what he created us to have. Go ahead. After this, I remembered about some difficulties of the confessor. And Jesus, seeing my thought, showed me as if I were inside a crystal, and this prevented others from seeing what the Lord was operating in me. Then he added, only in the reflections of light can one know the crystal and what it contains. The same with you. One who carries the light of faith will touch what I operate in you with his own hand. If then he does not, he will see things in a natural way. 
Um, I want to point out that today uh, uh, we celebrated the memorial of St. Agatha. And St. Agatha was tortured terribly uh, <clears throat> and threatened with more tortures unto death. And uh, she did not waver from her uh, virginity unto martyrdom uh, in her faithfulness to God. She had made the decision to give herself entirely to the Lord in, uh, in her childhood. And she stayed faithful to that. That is a surrender of oneself, no matter what it cost her personally. At a certain point, it must have been pretty extreme because the Lord gave her a vision of St. Peter to encourage and strengthen her uh, towards the last tortures unto her, receiving two crowns, crown of virginity, crown of martyrdom. So we ask the Lord to help us with whatever his will is for us so that uh, we can receive all that he has prepared for us. Go ahead. November 20th, 1900. Since Louisa must live from the heart of Jesus, he gives her rules in order to undertake a more perfect way of living. While I am outside of myself, my adorable Jesus continues to show me my heart inside of his, but so transformed that I can no longer recognize which one is mine and which one is Jesus's. He has conformed it perfectly to his own. He has impressed on it all the insignia of the passion, making me understand that from the moment of his conception, his heart was conceived with these insignia of the passion, so much so that what he suffered at the end of his life was an outpouring of that which his heart had suffered continuously. I seem to see one just like the other. I seem to see my beloved Jesus occupied in preparing the place in which he was to put the heart, perfuming it and bejeweling it with many different flowers. And while he was doing this, he told me, my beloved, since you must live from my heart, it is appropriate for you to undertake a more perfect way of living. Therefore, from you, I want one, perfect conformity to my will, because you will only be able to love me perfectly if you love me with my own will. Even more, I tell you that by loving me with my own will, you will arrive at loving me and your neighbor with my same way of loving. Okay, we stop there for just a sec. <clears throat> uh, from the very beginning down through this first step that he's uh, presenting to her, uh, is he's making it clear that he's the transformer, but it takes the cooperation of the one that's being transformed. And to move along in this process of his transforming, his perfecting the soul, it takes a, a complete surrender to his will. And not just once, but continuously. And in this process of complete surrender to his will, he can bring the soul to loving him completely. And you can, one of the tests for that is if you have a genuine love for your neighbor. Now, we're not talking about affection or emotion. We're talking about a desire for the salvation of your neighbor, just like you want a fullness of the life that the Lord is offering you because of the love that you have for the Lord and your understanding of his limitless love for your neighbor. So you don't want him to lose anyone. That's what that's part of the life that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Jacinta experienced to the point of sacrificing herself. Go ahead. Number two, profound humility, placing yourself in front of me and of creatures as the last among all. Three, purity in everything. Because my slightest fault against purity, both in loving and in operating, is reflected all in the heart, and it remains stained. Therefore, I want purity to be like a dew upon the flowers at the rising of the sun, which its rays reflecting upon them transmutes those little drops into as many precious pearls, such as to enchant the people. In the same way, if all your works, thoughts, and words, heartbeats and affections 
desires and inclinations are adorned with the celestial dew of purity, you will weave a sweet enchantment, not only for the human eye, but for the whole of heaven. So this purity, certainly it applies to sexuality, but not only. It, it's, again, back to Jacinta, she said that the sin that offends the, the sacred heart and the immaculate heart the most are sins of impurity. But <clears throat> this purity that he's calling for is also purity of intention. And wherever there's self-interest that enters into the decisions that we make or our own actions, those are impure, and I'm not talking about sexuality at this point, but they're impure intentions. There's a personal focus. So certainly, uh, if there's a crown of virginity, the, the sexual purity is vitally important, and that's why Satan works so hard in our time to get everybody stained up. We have to be careful about the way we feed our senses, because we take into ourselves that which can block. Uh, he's using an example of of uh, sweet dew and flowers. Those are just to give us um, words that we can grasp beauty and fragrance. Uh, in his gaze, uh, it's incomparable what he can see in a pure soul. Uh, for uh, many of us who haven't lived perfect lives, and uh, a good prayer would be to ask him to so fill us with his light that any areas of darkness that we've taken in through our senses in the past are driven out, just like um, if you had uh, uh, a container that has some kind of residue and you start running very pure water for a long period of time, it can, it can clean that container out and uh, fill it with the purity of the, of the water that you're putting in. Well, the living water can accomplish that and the very light of God's love can accomplish that, but we have to want that. And we have to strive to want it as much as he wants it. Okay, go ahead. Number four, obedience, which must be connected with my will. Because if this virtue regards the superiors I have given you on earth, my will is obedience, which regards me directly. So much so that it can be said that both one and the other are virtues of obedience. With this difference alone, one regards God and the other regards men. However, both of them have the same value and one cannot be without the other. Therefore, you must love both one and the other in the same way. Then he added, know that from now on, you will live with my heart and you must see things the way my heart does that I may find my satisfactions in you. Therefore, be careful. But this is no longer your heart, but mine. So the more that we give our heart to him, the more we have to guard against anything that would um, uh, make him not welcome or, or, or drive him away. Uh, <clears throat> I think about the, uh, the many lessons that we have related to right disposition to receive Holy Communion and then the attentiveness to him having re just received him in Holy Communion. So he's... Uh, he only feels welcome to the degree that we are welcoming. He only feels uh, uh, gratitude, you know, Eucharist is thanksgiving, gratitude uh, to the degree that we really are generous in giving him time and thanking him for all the ways that he blesses us. And so uh, this transformation that he can bring about will fill us with more love for him and more love for, for humanity. Go ahead. November 22nd, 1900. Jesus puts himself in the place of the heart and tells her what food he wants from her. My adorable Jesus continues to make himself seen. This morning, having received communion, I saw him in my interior, as well as our two hearts so identified with each other as to seem to be one. My most sweet Jesus told me today, I have decided to give you back, not your heart, but myself in its place. At that moment, I saw Jesus placing himself in that point where the heart is. And from within Jesus, I received respiration and I felt the beating of his heart. How happy I felt living in this position. After uh, this. Hopefully you're noticing that uh, 
these um, special lights uh, and lessons that he's giving her are after she's received communion. We've, we've had this a few times now. <clears throat> Keep in mind that uh, after she received communion, she would be in, in contemplation for two to three hours. So she, she gave him time. That doesn't mean <clears throat> that uh, she received communion, boom, all of this immediately was given to her. And then she went back to the knitting of altar cloths. She gave herself to him who gave himself to her. Now, for a lot of us, it's not possible to spend two to three hours immediately after Mass, but <clears throat> probably all of us, me included, could give more time after Mass, really letting him put into us what he came bringing. He always comes bringing gifts. He knows what's best for us. Uh, in one of the meditations that uh, I think I sent out a while back, um, uh, he expressed a little bit of a disappointment because he comes to put so much good in us, so much light. And uh, quite often after communion, we have this list of things he we want him to do for us. And he loves us, so he listens, but he already knows what's best for us and has gifts. He comes bearing gifts for transformation. So let's keep that in mind related to the, uh, the period of time that we have for Thanksgiving after communion. Go ahead. After this, he added, since I myself have taken the place of the heart, it is appropriate for you to have food always ready to nourish me. This food will be my will, and everything through which you mortify yourself, and of which you will deprive yourself for love of me. But who can say all that passed between Jesus and me in my interior? I believe it is better to keep silent. Otherwise, I feel as if I would ruin it since my tongue is not well refined to be able to speak of graces so great which the Lord has given to my soul. There is nothing left for me but to thank the Lord who has looked upon a soul so miserable and sinful. So he's asking for nourishment and he says that the food that he's looking for is his will because <clears throat> we cannot generate anything that is eternally beneficial or a limitless good. So how do you do that? Well, yes, the divine will, yes, the divine will to receive Holy Communion and you're receiving Holy Communion. So that already within you is the divine will reigning in you as you go up to receive Communion. And when the divine will is reigning in you in whatever you're doing, including going up to receive Communion, it is Christ himself who's operating in you. And so if you're inviting the divine will to receive communion in your receiving communion and to be giving thanks and praise and love after receiving communion with the divine will, you're giving him limitless nourishment, which he gives to us to, uh, to start with. Every good thing that we have comes from God. And the more that we realize that, the more we can invite the full participation of the goodness of God in what we do. Go ahead. November 23rd, 1900. How all souls are in Jesus. As I was in my usual state, my loving Jesus transported me outside of myself and coming out from within my interior, he showed himself so big as to absorb the whole earth within himself. And he spread his magnitude so much that my soul could not find the end of it. I felt dissolved in God, and not only myself, but all creatures were dissolved in him. Oh, how unseemly it appeared, and an affront is given to our Lord, when we, little worms, though living in him, dare to offend him. Oh, if all could see how we are in God, oh, how careful they would be not to cause him even a sh shadow of displeasure. Then he became so tall as to absorb the whole of heaven in himself. So in God himself, I could see everyone, angels and saints. I could hear their singing. I could understand many things about eternal happiness. So this is a mystery. It's something that we take by faith. <clears throat> we know that <clears throat> Nothing exists outside of God. He is everywhere, uh, but he is more personal than we are to ourselves. So it's, it's not this cosmic 
uh, energy thing that uh, New Agers get caught up in. It's just that we can't, we can't imagine his immensity and his willingness to be as small as one little particle of a consecrated host, because God is not limited by time or space. Go ahead. <laughs> After this, I saw many rivulets of milk flowing from Jesus. I drank of those rivulets, but since I was very limited, and Jesus was so big and tall as to have no end, either in magnitude or in height, I could not manage to absorb them all in me. Many of them would flow outside, though remaining in God himself. I felt displeasure, and I would have wanted everyone to run and drink at these rivulets, but so very scarce was the number of the pilgrim souls who would drink. Our Lord, too, was displeased by this. And he said to me, what you see is constrained mercy, and this irritates justice more. How can I make my justice when they themselves constrain my mercy within me? And I, taking his hands, clasped them together, saying, no, Lord, you cannot make justice. I do not want it, and since I do not want it, neither do you want it, because my will is no longer mine, but yours. And since it is yours, whatever I do not want, you do not want either. Have you not told me yourself that I must live of your will entirely and completely? My sweet Jesus was disarmed by my words. He became small again and enclosed himself in my interior. And I found myself inside myself. So <clears throat> she's interceding with the divine will, which is keeping the balance between mercy and justice. No human being can do that on their own, but she is inviting the divine will into this appeal that she's making, and she's appealing to him with his own goodness to hold at bay what humanity deserves. Go ahead. This is what the Blessed Mother does perfectly, constantly. We have no idea what the world would be like if there weren't souls praying in the divine will, and especially if we didn't have the perfect sovereign queen of the divine will, our blessed mother. Go ahead. November 25th, 1900. The nature of true love is to transmute pains into joys and bitterness into sweetnesses. Since my most sweet Jesus delayed in coming, I was almost afraid he would not come. But then to my surprise, all of a sudden he came and told me, my beloved, do you want to know when it is that a work is done for one's beloved? When encountering sacrifices, bitternesses, and pains, it has the virtue of changing them into sweetnesses and delights. In fact, this is the nature of true love, to transmute pains into joys and bitternesses into sweetnesses. If one experiences the opposite, it is a sign that it is not true love that is acting. Oh, in how many works they say, I do this for God. But then, at some encounters, they draw back. When this, they show that it was not for God, but for their own interest and for the pleasure they felt. So self-love yields the opposite of this love that he's calling us to. Self-love will pull back immediately if because there's a inconvenience or a bitterness or a lack of sweetness or some kind of discomfort. <clears throat> and so uh, you can see in the love, the genuine love of a mom or a dad or some um, a spouse uh, when at their own expense, they are doing for the other. And because of the good that the other is deriving from their, from their sacrifice, they are pleased. They, they go out of their way to help the one that they love so much. Well, that's on a human plane. The, <clears throat> the Lord is making it clear that this is the way he is with us all the time. And this is the way he wants us to be with him all the time. Go ahead. Then he added, generally, it is said, that one's own will ruins everything and infects the holiest works. Yet, if it is connected with the will of God, there is no other virtue that can suppress, that surpass this one's own will, because 
Where there is a will, there is life in operating good. But where there is no will, there is death in operating. For one operates with difficulty as though agonizing. So the fusion of our will with the will of God <clears throat> makes the works the holiest. So he says, generally, it is said that one's own will ruins everything and infects the holiest works, but it's all the opposite if the divine will is the animator of the works. So striving to fuse our will with the will of God is necessary for our works, even if they appear to be holy, to reach the highest holiness possible. Uh, Mark, if we go on to the next one, we're not going to be able to finish it before the end of the meeting. So <clears throat> I think we're going to close with prayer. Thank you very much for for helping us with uh, this uh, study session. Sure, thank you. So you'll be receiving um, a webinar link uh, Monday or Tuesday of next week as usual, uh, and it should bring you directly to this format. Um, and uh, again, on, on Monday afternoon, uh, this recording will uh, be posted on our mass and class portion of our website. Uh, we're going to close with the uh, prayer for the beatification of Luisa and then the prayer for the deliverance of all of humanity from the so many things that are causing, wreaking havoc in individual lives and in the world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, O Most Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise and thank you for the gift of holiness you granted to your faithful servant, Luisa Picaretta. She lived, dear Father, in your divine will and became under the influence of the Holy Spirit, similar to your son who died on the cross due to his obedience. She was a victim and a host welcome to you, thus contributing to the redemption of mankind. Her virtues of obedience, humility, love of Christ and to the church, urge us to ask you for the gift of her glorification on earth so that your glory may shine and your kingdom of truth, justice, and love may spread all over the world in the particular charism of the fiat voluntas tua, sequit in cello et in terra. We appeal to you by her merits to obtain from you almost holy trinity the particular grace of her beatification, which we ask of you with and in your divine will. O most sacred heart of my Jesus, who chose your humble servant Luis as the herald of the kingdom of your divine will and the angel of reparation for the countless sins that grieve your divine heart, we humbly pray you to grant us the grace through her intercession that we implore of your mercy so that she may be glorified on earth as you have rewarded her in heaven. And the deliverance prayer, we <clears throat> invite the divine will to pray in our praying in such a way that we may make this appeal on behalf of all souls, past, present, and future, and especially those who are so troubled in the world today through different addictions and, and uh, <clears throat> behaviors that are counterproductive and causing um, chaos in their own lives, in their families, and in the world. So we pray on their behalf as if they themselves were appealing to God for the freedom from everything that holds us back from living the will of God. O oh Lord, you are all-powerful. You are God. You are our Father. We beg you through the intercession and help of the archangels Michael, Raphael, and Gabriel, for the deliverance of our brothers and sisters who are enslaved by the evil one. All saints of heaven, come to our aid. From anxiety, sadness, and obsessions, we beg you, free us, O Lord. From hatred, envy, fornication, we beg you, free us, O Lord. From thoughts of jealousy, rage, and death, we beg you, free us, O Lord. From every thought of suicide and abortion, we beg you, free us, O Lord. From every form of sinful sexuality, we beg you, free us, O Lord. From every division in our family and every harmful friendship, we beg you, free us, O Lord. 
from every sort of spell, malefice, witchcraft, and every form of the occult, we beg you, free us, O Lord. You said, Lord Jesus, I leave you peace. My peace I give you. Grant that through the intercession of the Virgin Mary, we may be liberated from every evil spell and enjoy your peace always. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, come divine will, come to reign on earth, come divine will to reign in us. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for joining us tonight. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good night. Thank you, Father.